18 flights were canceled, 11 diverted. Hundreds of people were stranded inside Seville Airport with no clue why this happened. And outside, a small commercial jet was flying low, racing against the disaster and death. Passengers on the right side could literally see the airport below them, but the plane kept climbing. The captain picked up the radio and said, Pan Pan, which means danger but one step below Mayday. The whole airport was waiting only for this flight to land. But would they make it down alive? Because this kind of fault is prone to end in disaster. This is the breathtaking story of Vueling Flight 2020, one that will keep you on the edge of your seat. 20th of April, 2011, Wednesday, with passengers smiling air hostess, luggage and coffee cups, Flight 2020 was heading from Barcelona to Seville, just a one-hour journey across southern Spain. 150 people were on board and none of them had any idea what was coming. At the front of the plane, inside the cockpit, sat three pilots. The captain was experienced, 47 years old, French with more than 10,000 hours of flying. He knew the Airbus A320 like the back of his hand. Next to him was a trainee, a 42-year-old Spanish first officer with less than 1,000 hours of flight time. On this particular plane, he had flown just 90 hours, most of them in the past few weeks. If you compare it to cars, that's barely out of driving school. And because of his inexperience, there was a third man in the cockpit as a supervising pilot who was younger, 33, but highly trained. He was a former test pilot who had flown nearly 6,000 hours and trained at one of the best schools in the world the U.S.-based National Test Pilot School. In this flight, his job was to observe, offer advice if needed, and take over if things went wrong. And in this setup, this was their third flight of the day. Earlier, they'd already flown to Rome and back. Now, just before seven in the evening, they pushed back from Terminal 1 in Barcelona. The skies were perfect, the air was smooth, conditions couldn't be better. But the flight wasn't as easy as you might think. Not only were they flying a tight, short route, which meant more radio calls, more changes in altitude, more pressure to act fast, but they were also in training mode. The captain would fly the first leg to Seville. The trainee would watch and learn. On the return trip, they'd swap roles. Anyway, when they rolled to the runway, the captain used the tiller, which is a small steering wheel that works only on the ground, to line the plane up. He pushed the throttle forward. The engines roared to life. The plane shook slightly as it picked up speed, and a few seconds later, it lifted off the runway normally. The plane reached their cruising altitude, 35,000 feet, in no time. The cabin crew and her four flight attendants moved through the aisles, offering snacks and drinks. The A320 aircraft they were flying was one of the airline's oldest, 21 years old, built back in 1990. But it had been well cared for, and more importantly, it had one key feature that made it feel ahead of its time, E-C-A-M. ECAM stands for Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor, which is like the plane's built-in doctor. It constantly checks everything, air pressure, hydraulics, electronics, and more. If something breaks or acts strange, ECAM spots it. Not only that, it shows the pilots exactly what's wrong and suggests what to do next. Overall, it's a system that troubleshoots any problem of the aircraft and reports to the pilots. Now keep that information in mind, we'll come back to it soon. About 25 minutes into the flight, the supervising pilot decided to take a break. So, he left the cockpit to sit in the passenger cabin for a while. Meanwhile, the captain and the trainee were doing fine. But the moment he had barely closed the door and it happened, first a soft beep, then another. ECAM lit up with green letters appeared on the screen. Of course, something was wrong, but there was no turbulence, no noise, no shaking. Still, ECAM was sending a small warning and this meant something big. The most horrible part was, Gak, when two pilots in action stared at the screen, the trainee one understood nothing, and the captain also had never faced this particular issue before. And the man who might have helped the most by that time left the cockpit already. But what did the warning mean? A glitch or something much more serious? They had only a few minutes to figure it out, and then everything changed again. At 29 minutes past seven, the plane had barely entered Madrid's airspace when the first warning light lit up. And just the moment they were trying to figure it out, suddenly came the big blow. The captain's primary flight display, the main screen showing speed, altitude, and direction, was completely gone. Before the crew could even react, the ECAM flashed again. This time, with a more serious message, nose wheel steering fault. That meant the small front wheel under the plane, which is used to steer on the ground, was no longer under control. In more simple terms, they could land, sure, but once they touched down, the plane might not go straight. 
It might not stop where it was supposed to, or worse, it might not stop at all. Luckily, seconds later, the flight display came back, but the nose wheel problem didn't go away. The captain kept calm and remembered something he'd read in the technical logbook earlier that day, a note about the very same nose wheel issue, which the maintenance guys thought was resolved. But now, mid-air, with 150 passengers behind them, that same problem was back. So the captain pulled out the plane's quick reference handbook. It's basically a thick emergency manual with step-by-step -step instructions for every known problem in aviation, much like an encyclopedia or dictionary. There he found one suggestion. Try resetting a flight computer, which is like turning a phone off and on again to clear a glitch. But the captain paused. What if restarting a system mid-flight made things worse? What if they lost more than just steering? So he decided to leave it as it was without gambling with it. Meanwhile, the new first officer buried himself in the manuals, scanning for procedures. He checked everything, but nothing helped. And the captain knew they were too close to landing, so they cannot just turn back now. So at this point, the captain made a sharp call. He replaced the trainee pilot with the backup first officer, who was taking rest in the cockpit. Because he had dealt with this kind of failure before, that simple move silently said that it wasn't just a minor issue anymore. The nose wheel was still stuck. It had rotated a full 90 degrees, locked sideways. When the nose wheel steering fails, the system automatically turns the wheel sideways to keep it from spinning uncontrollably. It's like slamming the wheels of a shopping cart sideways so it won't roll away. Smart in theory, but landing a 70-ton airplane on a wheel frozen like that? Extremely risky. The crew knew the odds. They had to land the plane even though one of the wheels was twisted in the wrong direction only with the help of the brakes, reverse thrust, and luck. The only thing working in their favor was the weather. Plus, the runway in Seville was also wide and long. So the first thing the captain did was pick up the radio and make the call. Pan Pan, which means it's not yet a mayday, but just a level below. Within a moment, air traffic control stopped all other flights. Hundreds of people inside Seville's airport had no idea why their planes were suddenly delayed. But the runway had just been cleared for one aircraft only, Flight 2020. The captain also called the airline's maintenance team again, not because they could fix anything in the air, but because the plane would need fast repairs or a fire truck or both, once it landed, or worse, if it landed. At exactly 19 minutes past eight, the flight lined up with runway 27. The first officer lowered the landing gear, but that was the easy part. The rest was up to gravity, physics, and sheer nerve. But what happened next that was not something they expected. The plane jerked heavily. The autopilot went off without warning. Seconds later, the screen went dark, flight directors gone, and the auto thrust failed too, and three vital systems were down back to back. Now the captain had to fly the plane by hand, manually. That's like driving a speeding car on a highway, and suddenly, the cruise control, GPS, and power steering all shut off. Only you're gripping the wheel tightly, hoping the brakes hold, but the worst was still ahead. A red warning suddenly flashed on their screen. The nose gear, the small wheel under the front of the plane, was showing pressure. As if the plane was already on the ground, but it wasn't, they were still high in the air. The main landing gear said everything was fine, so what caused the nose gear to feel pressure in mid-air unless it was broken? The first officer's heart skipped. He'd seen this before in a 2005 JetBlue flight. That plane's nose wheel twisted sideways in mid-air too, and it had to do an emergency landing in Los Angeles. Were they facing the same nightmare? They had to know for sure. The captain asked the Seville control tower for help. He flew the plane low, just 100 feet above the runway, so someone could look at the situation. People sitting on the right side of the plane could see the airport right beneath them. Then came the answer from the tower. The nose wheel is turned sideways 90 degrees. This wasn't just a sensor issue, but a mechanical failure. If the rubber tire tore apart during landing, the metal rim could hit the ground, cause sparks, maybe a fire. If the gear couldn't hold, the plane might slam face down and skid across the runway. This wasn't just serious, but also life-threatening danger that deserves a call for Mayday. So the captain pulled the plane up again, climbing back to 2,000 feet to buy some time and figure out how to land with a sideways nose wheel. But turning north would take them into a thunderstorm as a dark cloud loomed ahead. So they asked if they could circle south instead. Air traffic control said yes. They climbed to 3,500 feet again. Meanwhile, the clock was ticking and they needed a plan, fast. So they asked for foam on the runway. This is something that reduces fire if the nose caught fire. The captain handed control to the first officer. Then he called the head flight attendant into the cockpit. He explained it all. The gear was jammed. They'd try to land in 10 minutes. Two minutes before landing, he'd call out, 
finished preparation, and one minute before, he'd shout, brace, brace. He also warned they might need to evacuate fast. After the briefing, the captain made another big call. He chose to land without using the plane's autobrake system. He wanted to brake manually, using full reverse thrust, blasting the engines in reverse to stop faster. He remembered the JetBlue case. The runway of Seville Airport is 11,024 feet long, and that plane needed nearly 11,000 feet to stop. This time, the captain wanted to stop the plane before that. But another problem came up. The manual they checked said to lower the nose early while they still had rudder control to avoid a sudden crash forward later. But the issue was, that guide was written for a loose nose gear, not a jammed one. Still, they used it anyway, thinking it was better than nothing. As a result, the checklist told them to shut down the engines before the nose touched the ground. But that was impossible. No engines meant no reverse thrust, which means no brakes. So they made a new plan, keep the engines on until the nose was down, then cut them. Actually, this kind of decision-making under pressure is where pilots earn their wings. Of course, simulators train them for emergencies, but not for real fear, not for the sound of passengers crying. But then came more bad news. ATC radioed back with the news that the runway foam wasn't available. To the crew, it felt like one more safety net was gone. Foam only makes the runway slippery, harder to brake on, harder to steer. It even blocks visibility. Many airports had already stopped using it, but to these pilots, alone in a failing plane, it felt like the ground had just dropped out beneath them. Now there were no more crutches, just instinct, skill set, and each other. Meanwhile, fuel was also running out, only three tons left. Normally, that would be fine, but with the landing gear already down, the plane was burning fuel three times faster than usual, so the pilots couldn't go around anymore. They had to land right now, no second chances. Over the radio, the fire brigade confirmed they were ready. The cabin crew said all passengers were strapped in. That's it. The captain lined up with runway 27 for their last try. At 400 feet, the plane started calling out altitude. 400, 300, 200. Below, fire trucks waited with sirens off but engines rumbling. Then the command came, brace for impact. The wheels hit the runway pretty hard with a speed of 240 kilometers per hour. The spoilers popped. The captain slammed reverse thrust. The plane shook violently. The nose stayed up. The captain waited until the speed went below 90 knots, and he gently dropped the nose. Then it happened. The front tire started ripping apart the moment it touched. It burst seconds later. Now it was a race against death. Could they stop the plane before the metal rim hit the ground? The captain pushed harder, more reverse, more brakes. The plane slowed fast. At 30 knots, the engines shut off, and the plane finally rolled to a stop. The screens in the cockpit went off. A faint smell of burned rubber filled the air. But miraculously, there was no fire. Firefighters checked, all clear. At 9 p.m., passengers got off using stairs. Buses took them to the terminal. No one was hurt. Only one tire had burst. But the later shocks came from the investigation. Turns out three things had gone wrong. First, bad maintenance caused electrical sparks. Second, the steering valve was in the wrong place. Third, the landing gear lever gave the wrong signal. It told the plane it was flying when it wasn't. This wasn't a one-time thing. 18 similar cases had already happened, eight different causes, and no clear checklist to guide pilots. So Airbus was told to fix it, create a proper plan, or next time, there might not be a safe landing with zero casualties at all. Now imagine you were in that cockpit. Would you have taken the same risks? Would you shut down the engines at that decision moment or keep them running? Tell us in the comments, what decision would you question the most from this flight? And do you think the JetBlue incident helped save lives here? Share your thoughts. Subscribe for more real aviation stories where calm minds face chaos in the sky. Until we meet next, fly safe.